Good evening, colleagues, uh, students, friends. Um, so I'm Professor Diabetti. I'm the Vice Chancellor at Ingram at the University of Cape Town, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this lecture, which is going to be delivered by Professor Ruzani Meloiwa, who is the head of the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at UCT and uh, the Red Cross Hospital, Red Cross Memorial Hospital. Um, and also the co-director of the Vaccines for Africa Initiative in the Faculty of Health Sciences. <clears throat> I'm really very pleased also to welcome Professor Malumio's wife, Dr. Nina Adelaide Masu, their daughter, Bele, and his parents, sister, brother, and sister-in-law. Wonderful to have you here with us. And it gives me particular pleasure also to welcome here this evening our Vice Chancellor designate, Professor Mosa Moshabella. Uh, so, dear friends, let me uh, introduce the platform party for this evening's event. We have on Professor Moshabella's right, uh, Professor, Professor Lionel Green Thompson, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and who will introduce our speaker shortly. And then on his right is our inaugural lecturer, Professor uh, <laughs> Bereva. <laughs> And we shall hear from him before long. Uh, on his right, we have Mr. Mukoni Rachitanga, who is uh, International Relations Advisor to the Deputy President of South Africa, and who will later on deliver a vote of thanks. And we also have Professor Hilazar, the far right, Chair of the Department of Pediatrics at UCT, who will deliver, deliver closing remarks. Then on the far right is my colleague, Professor Elwani Ramagrande, who is Deputy Vice Chancellor for Transformation, Student Affairs and Social Responsiveness. And I think I've got everyone covered there. Um, so um, colleagues and friends, in all your lectures are really a very special event in the life of the university. They mark the ascent, if you like, to uh, full professorship, which is the highest rank to which a, an academic staff member may aspire, and certainly this one that is aspired to by all serious scholars. Whether one is appointed to this rank or promoted to it, it certainly constitutes recognition of the stature of the individual and of the high quality and of the impact of their academic work. The process, I can tell you, leading to becoming a professor by what, whichever route is an arduous one. The criteria are extremely demanding, and so the rank is all the more prized. Coming to the lecture, well, inaugural lecture, lectures provide an opportunity to celebrate the achievements of the lecturer, the professor. They also, importantly, provide an opportunity for the lecturer to share insights into his scholarly work in a manner that will be accessible to a broad audience, to tell us, in other words, something of what they profess. So by increasing our understanding of Professor Milovivo's work in pediatric health, we also build our own understanding of how we can be better caregiving, if you like, not only of children, but also of our future as a nation, as a country. Um, I'd like to quote a, an opinion piece from the Maryland Guardian earlier this month um, on this broad topic. Um, so here I quote, an undeniable precondition for genuine national unity is the eradication of inequity. Stunting is one of the major fact factors for inequality, and rectifying this can break the intergenerational cycle of poverty in which 
so many in, so many in South Africa are trapped. Stunted children grow up to be adults who are most likely to be poor, unskilled, unemployed, and also to suffer from chronic diseases such as hypertension and diabetes. Linked to the, all of this would be linked to the poor development of the brain and also to organs such as the pancreas in the first 1,000 days of their lives. So there is so much that depends on how we address all of these issues from day one, if not before then. Today, children in South Africa face additional threats from the impacts of climate change and exposure to well, to physical violence, but also to online violence, exploitation and abuse through easier access to the internet, as well as many health-related obstacles to their growth and their pathways to strong adulthood. Such threats render Professor Nuloiwo's focused research on child health all the more important, in fact, vital for us at this time. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me pleasure now to hand the podium over to Professor Lionel Green-Thompson, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Olueni Sanbonani Fernand, Wamkelekile Apa University Asekapa. The place that we occupy was first called by the people that lived here first long before the settlers came along. It was called Kamirodi Chais, which means place of the stars. And we recognize in that history, their own healing capacity here on the banks of the Hurikwaha mountain. So welcome to this event. It's an event that we've looked forward to for some time now. <laughs> Nda Nda Ndi Madikwana Votanga Let me start that again so I can hear Nda Ndi Madikwana Votanga Nedzwa Karife Nfulu Kava Nozwikona Let me greet especially the family this evening and to, to the people from whom uh, Rozani comes. We give a great uh, sense of gratitude to you because without you, we don't have the gifts that come from Benda. But I want to just acknowledge his wife, Dr. Ngina Masu, who is here. And I, I recognize that in so many of the stories we've shared, yours is a constant background music to his life. But I want to acknowledge particularly Vele Mutio Moloiwa, uh, Rosani's daughter, and I see she's acknowledging that I've said her name correctly. But she helped me spell it earlier when she, when she told me how it should be written. So colleagues, this is a little bit of a different kind of introduction because when I asked Rosani for his CV on the weekend, he said CVs are generally useless things. I should rather, I should rather ask him a series of questions that I wanted to speak to in my introduction. And so I did. But he delayed in the responses to those. <laughs> but I met Trudzani Mulaiwa on the Sunday of the 15th of March, 2020. It was an urgent afternoon meeting in Glenara convened by the then VC, Professor Pakeng. It was at that meeting that we decided to close the university the next day in the face of the pandemic. But I want to acknowledge today very specially that in the next couple of days, Rudzani, amongst other people, stood along my, alongside me as we navigated that process of engaging with students to reassure them that we were not abandoning them. 
And I think that those were really significant days, Razan, and those who gathered alongside me, I acknowledge as part of that journey. But importantly, when the team was, was complete and all of the deanery members had taken their places, Razania withdrew into the background because he reckoned that it was time for our voice to be heard more clearly and our spirit to be felt. And so I'm really grateful to that to you for Razani for recognizing that moment of transition. I made an attempt at at, at uh, Chivenda this evening, but I want to recognize uh, Razani's capacity for languages. He claims he speaks excellent Chivenda. <laughs> <laughs> Good, he's good at Setswana, Sesutu, and Sepedi, and his class and his Zulu. Basic Afrikaans, basic Chichonga, but basic Shona, Kiswahili, and Chichewa. And I make that point, colleague, because of all of the things that I'm grateful to Razani for, is that he's acknowledged our attempt to speak other languages than English in this space. And he's constantly affirmed my rudimentary attempts in that regard. <laughs> and I challenge all of you to keep trying to do that. But so today, my introduction will be a mixture of, of, of thinking about Razani and his place in the faculty and some of the things that have come from his CV and then some of the things he responded to my email on. And I want to capture those, some of you may have read about threshold concepts in education, this idea that there are things without which you may not be part of the discipline. These little nuggets of knowledge that you have to master. And I think there's a contestation about what those are. But Cousin in a, in a, in a paper in, the, in Planet speaks about this idea that grasping a threshold concept is transformative because it involves an ontological as well as a conceptual shift. And, and if, you, if you listen to Razani this evening, you'll almost certainly hear that ontological shift because the delay in this lecture has been because he's been fully engaged in the matters of the, the uh, executive MBA, which he's just completed. And he's... But it also speaks, Cousin speaks also of the fact that a threshold concept is irreversible. That once you understand something, you're unlikely to forget it. And in some of the stories that, that Razani tells about this return to the Sotpansberg as the place where he renews himself in the constant pressures that life in Cape Town sometimes puts on us. But what is really important is this idea of the irreversibility of the origin that you come from. And I think Razani will manifest that again today. But he speaks about, she, she speaks about the fact that a threshold concept is integrated because it exposes the hidden interrelatedness of phenomena. And part of my own journey with Razani and um, the, one of the things, uh, Dr. Masu, that you, you, you apparently have taught him is this uh, affection for coffee. <laughs> Apparently, he learned coffee because of you. That's what he tells us. But one of the things about coffee and this integrative nature of coffee is that I can't put sugar in my coffee in Zulzani's office. <laughs> he says he will allow me a drop of milk, but nothing more than that. Um, and it is this idea of integrating something that you care for so deeply into the engagement with other people. And then this, this special concept as, as this terminal boundaries as having borders in, in some way. And the idea that even as Razani has engaged in the faculty, he's constantly at the threshold of something new, of new ways of being, of new ways of engaging. Can you imagine at UCT a presentation for the headship of the department that foregrounds general child health? I think unheard of here where subspecialty is so foregrounded in the story of who we are. Here was Razani on that occasion, pushing the boundary of what pediatrics and child health could possibly mean for us. But also the threshold concept is likely to involve forms of troublesome knowledge. Knowing Razani is in itself a troublesome knowledge. 
But in fact, in all of the engagements that one has with Ruzani, one leaves with a sense of troublement. This idea that you shouldn't always think the same way as you did yesterday. And I, I see the nods in the audience to attest to that fact that Ruzani in his scholarship and in his being is constantly calling us to be different, constantly calling us to be you. I want to share this personal story he gave to me um, as part of the responses to the questions. My place has always been the Sofansberg Mountains. It is the place I've always gone back to if I needed to find myself again. After qualifying as a pediatrician, I resigned to work at Donald Fraser, a rural hospital where I was born. It's also the village in which my mother grew. The matron of my word, Ms. ward, Mrs. Ntangeni, was the midwife who had delivered me. And that says such a lot that in the story that he tells of his life, the midwife who made him what he is today is recorded as part of that legacy. But he went on to take a Nelson Mandela scholarship to the London School, um, where he did a, a degree in statistics and epidemiology. The other thing that Zani contested in, in, in this idea of using a, a, a a CV is qualifications, and I'll come back to those in a little while. But he does recognize he's a, a Natal graduate. He graduated from that school by the seat. But I want to say this part of his answer that I was influenced by the amazing people in Limpopo's Petersburg Mankwane Hospital Complex. Anne Robertson, Chris Sutton, the late Nancy Shipolana, and Kenny Hamizi. Not because they were fantastic clinicians, which they were, but because they cared. He went on to a number of qualifications after this. It was an MSc in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. On returning to Cape Town, my then fiancé wanted to be here. And he, he claims that the late Professor Mayosi convinced him to do a PhD. Amongst the people in his story are Professor Heather Zah and Professor Greg Hussey, who he attributes the success of his PhD to. And having been here for the last year of that PhD, I think they must have aged considerably. In that. <laughs> One of the last things I, I asked Rudani to, to reflect on for this evening is because the question of being a professor in South Africa is a vexed issue. Are we professors for our own good, or are we professors for the good of our people? And Ernest Boy in 1990 already wrote um, about scholarship reconsidered, revisiting the priorities of the professoriate. And I should have known that when I sent this to Rosani, he would write back and say, I've read that. <laughs> but I attached the article anyway to kind of guide him to what I was thinking about, and I asked him to reflect on his journey in the four scholarships that Boyer speaks of. And Boyer has a, a scholarship of discovery. I disconnected myself, sorry. Um, but I'm sure you're hearing me, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. For so the online people. Oh, or online people. Please get on that disrespectful at all. So I want to just make a few points in each of these scholarships that Boyer describes, because in fact, in the way that Boyer constructed scholarship and the nature of the professoriate, it is a clarion call to those of us who claim professorship to behave differently. And so he speaks about the scholarship of discovery. And I want to say that Rosani graduated with the PhD in 2021, that, that seminal moment of contributing to discovery. His PhD was, the epidemiology of pertussis in children hospitalized with a respiratory tract infection. And I want to give you the, the lines from the end of his abstract for that PhD. He writes, in the final chapter of the thesis, I conclude the thesis by making an argument that are, although there are still knowledge gaps, the thesis gives a clear indication that pertussis remains a serious problem in LMICs, lower middle income countries, especially for some groups that show increased risk of the disease and its severe consequences. The second scholarship that Boyer speaks of is the scholarship of integration. 
And in Rodzani's notes, he speaks about the EMBA being UCT's greatest gift to him. And I have to say, being in class with him, you almost hoped he didn't ask a question. <laughs> because invariably, the question led him to answering the question in a bit more depth than the lecturer had done. <laughs> and it is a fascinating thing to engage in this level of discourse with him. But I, I must say, and clearly pleasing to see people from the EMBA here this evening. But perhaps those of us who know Ruzani and his work recognize the scholarship of application, what Boyer refers to as the scholarship of engagement. And in many of the things that Ruzani has said, he's on the board of Shoko, he's on the advisory board of Students for a Better Future and One to One Africa. But all of the things he does, and even his service at, at um, the council until July this year, I think that is one of his most joyful moments was when his time, when his time at council finished, having gone through a lot of toil. And then finally, this idea of a scholarship of teaching and learning. My own encounter with Ruzani is this capacity to teach without teaching and to learn even when you feel like you're, you're, you're being taught. And so there's this incredible manifestation of the teacher but again, in response to my email, Rosani sent me an article because he can think differently about this again. But he spoke, he sent me a thing by Walter Knoll on the role of the professor. And in the paper, Knoll refers to the teacher, the researcher, and then the professor as something else. The professor's focus, and I quote, the professor's focus on the other hand is on understanding, gaining insight into, judging the significance of, and organizing old knowledge. He, and increasingly she, is disturbed by the pile up of undigested and ill understood new results. He is not happy until he has been able to fit these results into a larger context. He is happiest if he can find a new conceptual framework, wait for this lecture, with which to unify and simplify the results which have been found by the researcher. <clears throat> Priority is not an issue for him. And colleagues, in waiting for this lecture, uh, Ruzani was, was at pains to point out his gratitude that we allowed him to delay it for so long because he wanted to make manifest the learnings from the EMBA. I offer you Professor Ruzani Mulogu. Rivato Arnachashi Udivita Hambirun Difficotundu Uvani Uno Arnamkove Chumbeo Chino Askirangwa Garin. Some of you would um, already be aware that the headlines my talk is sourced probably pretty much about him from. Um, an ancient Hebrew text. The Babylonian Empire that had been spreading and had conquered most of the Middle East, including what is used to be called Syro uh, Palestine at that time, um, and taken over other empires and pushed Egypt back southwards. As part of a common ancient uh, strategy to fully demoralize conquered people, they displaced the vanquished uh, uh, from their own lands. It is from this place of exile that Ezekiel gives these vivid first person narratives of visions he experienced. Perhaps nowhere else is the depth of despair and hopelessness for these displaced people more visibly displayed than here when Ezekiel is shown this valley that is full of bones and is asked the question, son of man, 
can these bones live? From his response, it is obvious that Ezekiel does not think that there's any hope at all. But being a priest and the question coming from the Almighty, uh, he had to give some sort of, um, you know, deference by responding with a diplomatic, only you know. <laughs> Son of man is perhaps best translated as human one to reveal the intention behind the naming. It carries with it both the helplessness that is perennial to all human efforts and at the same time highlights the beauty hidden in embracing being truly human. It is this contrast that I seek to talk to today. This recognition of hopelessness and this acknowledgement that I believe contain the seed in which our hope ultimately lies. But first thing first, I would really like to take this time to acknowledge uh, my CEO of my hospital, Anita Pabu, who's here tonight, and my medical manager, and they're sitting next to her. And I would like to recognize uh, members of the executive of the University of Cape Town, uh, um, the interim vice chancellor, um, emeritus professor, Dia Reddy, as well as our incoming vice chancellor, Professor Musa Mushavela. Acknowledged members of the university executive who are also here. Um, and I would like to thank the dean of my faculty by indulging me by waiting so long before <laughs> making me do this. Um, and I really promise to be kind and gentle by trying to read from the script than, than <laughs> not the card. And I really want to thank you for your generous introduction this evening. Thank you very much. But I would also like to acknowledge members of my department who have come here in large numbers to support me tonight. And, um, and I really appreciate that. And in doing this acknowledgement, I'm well aware that at the end, I am going to fail to acknowledge all of you in the way you deserve. Throughout this lecture, however, I'll be dropping names. Um, and those names will be, dropping those names will be ways of acknowledging you. But I do hope that whether named or not, in parts of the lecture, you'll recognize yourselves as highly valued and acknowledged as those who have made my life and that of our community truly rich. And I just want to thank uh, Tembakazi and um, uh, Abigail Adams, who were very much stressed by getting everything organized and, and flux and changes through this time. So really appreciate your efforts. You're really amazing. So I acknowledge all of you. I see you, or as the Zulu saying goes, Sandwanani. This is a photo of Emmanuel Mukenzira, one of the survivors of the Rwandan genocide. And I met him 15 years ago in 2009 when I had the privilege of attending a conference in Butare, a city in the southern parts of Rwanda. One of the activities the delegates undertook was to visit a local site that commemorates the 1994 genocide. For some reason, I only took this one photo of him. This is the guy who is holding his hand like that. The visit and the photo for me completes and completed a journey that started at medical school in 1994. That year, I was doing my second year in medicine at the then University of Natal. Although my parents don't know this, they were only finding out. <laughs> <laughs> I almost failed that year. <laughs> in the very month in which we held and celebrated our first democratic elections, a great massacre was unfolding north of us. And although there was no internet, I scoured newspapers for stories on what was happening. including stories on the refugees who were dying in thousands. And I fell into the state of 
uh, depression that I stopped going to class. I had to see a psychologist. And to be honest, I, it was not because I thought I needed a psychologist. I, <laughs> I, I, I needed uh, some grounds for appealing what I thought was important. <laughs> What was that? An impending exclusion. <laughs> Honestly, what turned the tide was me taking time to go home for the June holidays that year, which actually had a lot for to get a chance to to find myself again and to come back and uh, pass the year. Yet Morambi were to this picture. 50,000 people identified as Tutsi were rounded up from around surrounding communities, starved of water and food over a two week period, and then over a three day period attacked with all sorts of instruments available, grenades, guns, machetes, etc. Emmanuel was a rare survivor as virtually all 50,000 were exterminated. For the rest of the country, over barely a three and a half month period. Hundreds of thousands of people were massacred. Adults and children were indiscriminately killed. Sadly, while the Rwandan situation may be unique in its own way, this was not new or the last time. The world is rife with formally declared and undeclared war on children. In these wars, adults kill children. It happens all over the world. Adults have always killed children. Very often the killing is direct and violent. When that happens, the killing is accompanied by elaborate explanations and well-articulated arguments of why it had to be done. The arguments seek to show that the children were not the real targets. They just happened to be in the way of adults who needed to be killed. What did any reasonable person expect the killers to do? Huh? Sometimes children are killed because they are children of their parents who needed to be killed. In this case, no hard explanations for justification are required as the children hold the membership of groups of people that need killing. But more often, children are killed using neglect. This too is accompanied by well-articulated arguments of why their killing is unavoidable. This common and slow way, usually involving starvation, is generally more efficient in killing children. It has the added benefit of hardly attracting too much attention and thus making no one particularly accountable. Children are killed by both enemies and friends, strangers and family. They're killed by governments whom their parents vote for over and over and over every election cycle. Most of this killing of children happens in Africa. Most people know this, including some Africans who care to know Whether we acknowledge this or not, it would seem that in Africa, we have largely accepted this as the norm and our reality. We do not even count the number of our dead. If they are lucky, they get to be estimated. In the case of Rwanda, the estimates range from 491,000 uh, to 800,000, although some estimate numbers as high as a million. <laughs> this level, of precision would make a mediocre statistician blush with embarrassment. All these, of course, do not include the number of the maimed and permanently disabled by both these violent and non-violent wars on children. And so the question is, should, is whether we should indeed be willing to accept this as our lot the fate of our children. Throughout my preparation of this lecture, John Knox book was um, a plea from Africa kept playing on my head, and some would know that song. 
Give a thought to Africa Beneath a burning sun There a voice is crying there Waiting to be heard Many lives have passed away and in many homes, there are voices crying out to the living God. Finding solutions is not easy. In defining his theory of forms, Plato speaks of the world of being and the world which he contrasts with the world of becoming. While the former refers to those concepts that take on immutable forms, the latter, the world of becoming, refers to the world we experience around us, the physical world with all its changes and impermanence. It is this second imperfect state that modern thinkers such as uh, William Economy used to describe our world in light of its constant flux and evolution. While this includes natural processes such as climate change, it also refers to human-made changes in social, political and economic spheres. I'm taken back to my time in high school and my first reading of N.P. Van Veek uh, Lowe's poem. Do you again, boss? Some of you would remember this. Do you again, boss? A decadent that shall one crow thing a comet my crow thing a crow test and poise. When you were a child, you thought great things would come out of me big things, big and good. In the lines that follow, what eventually starts to happen starts looking more like an illusion which soon breaks down in the face of reality. Finally, a realization dawns that perhaps after all, the art is near the unfolding. The earth, the world, is not simple after all. If the world is so complex and apparently unpredictable, what hope have we got that it can ever be tamed, or if not wholly tamed, at least be managed such that we have some agency Specifically, in this case, if we would like to bring about the well being of particularly African children. So, I was appointed, as um, Professor Green Thompson mentioned, um, head of pediatrics and child health during the first year of the COVID 19 pandemic. And just because the Department uh, of Pediatrics and Child Health uh, mainly caters for individuals of small stature. It does not make it really does not make it any less uh, complex. <laughs> it took me a very short time to realize that the anatomy I did at medical school has not necessarily been taught with the aim of preparing me for leadership. <laughs> As I started to grapple, you know, with the requirement of the role, I was slightly comforted by my growing awareness that I was learning to fully embrace the responsibility it entailed. I started to understand that although the headship of the department exists independent of me, it nonetheless, like a garment that takes the shape of the one that wears it, that the role becomes ultimately and being formed by the person I am, including that which I will become. Or in the words of one of my favorite poets, Christopher Kibo, when you have finished and done up my stitches, wake me near the altar and this poem will be finished. It would seem that after all, the poem and the poet are inseparable. And I realized that I urgently needed a vantage point from where to inspect myself and get to know myself a bit. This led me to one of the, what, I, what Lionel pointed out, is a real gift from UCT afforded me. You know, the, it's executive MBA program, 
And I would like to thank you, uh, Koshik and the uh, team. Who of Koshik oversaw the program for a decade and is handed it over now to uh, Camille Mayer. While the EMBA may not have given me answers to the questions I have, it has given me tools for authentically approaching them. Or put differently, in the words of Raina Maria Rilke in his letter to a young poet, don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now, because you would not be able to leave them. And the point is to leave everything. Leave the questions now, perhaps then someday, find the future. You will gradually, without even noticing it, leave your way into the answer. Finally, whom I mentioned earlier on, argues that the understanding of the constant change of the world of becoming is crucial for navigating the complex challenges in the 21st century. This is what I sought to do with my EMBA uh, journey, and in particular, the mini dissertation. For us to understand, we perhaps have to take a bit of time and a moment, and I'm gonna try to explain this as best as I can. You know, the basis of the approach I took, and this should be seen in three levels, where there's a philosophy, there's methodology, and ultimately the tools underlying that approach. First, the philosophy. So if the world is complex, then it should be obvious that the philosophy to make sense of it must have the ability to engage with this complexity. Specifically, a philosophical outlook that by default acknowledges that the world is complex and contains many parts that affect each other in both obvious and perhaps not so obvious ways. That philosophy, it seems, would be indispensable for such a complex world. This is what the kind of concept I'm talking about is what has been referred to as a systems approach. And for this, I largely relied on the work of C. West Churchman. Churchman's approach to whole systems is a comprehensive framework um, of, for understanding and managing complex systems. It emphasizes the importance of considering all aspects of a system, including its environment, resources, components, and objectives. Churchman believed that traditional approaches to problem solving, which focus on optimizing individual parts, often fail to consider the broader context and can lead to unintended consequences. For me, the value-based worldview that is central to Churchman's approach to systems seemed most suited to the question which involves children. In dealing with topics central to the human condition, it would seem important that we consider the kind of tools that are attuned to the emotional aspect of the inquiry. Um, <coughs> someone called Carl Vick, who is an organizational theorist, he, he points out that theories must contain sufficient emotion to move others. And that's precisely what the philosophy that churchmen think I need. <laughs> <laughs> um, what churchmen does uh, uh, is engage with this at that level. Churchman was later himself to declare, as he looks at his work, that it would be a good thing if the system planner's germination was moral outrage and not just a mild felt need. In other words, he says, I do not think we should view the major problems of the world today with a calm objectivity. We shouldn't first ask ourselves for a precise and operational definition of malnutrition. We should begin with kids are starving in great numbers, damn it all. From a methodological point of view, the methodological approach that I took is based on the work of Churchman student, uh, Werner Ulrich a system that developed that is known as critical systems heuristics. And this is a framework for reflective practice designed to help us think critically and systematically about any situation of concern. And maybe a breakdown of that expression, critical systems heuristics would be helpful. So critical meaning reflectively inquiring into the validity of current thinking with a quest to uncover improved ways of perceiving and viewing the situation. Systems as what I mentioned earlier on, which is uh, seeking a holistic view and solution. 
one connected with past reality, but also seeking future relevance. The process itself is one of suing in views as opposed to seeking one ultimate correct view and solution. And finally, heuristics, which is a process where all participants in the situation collectively learn their way towards a shared understanding and alignment around it. That's what critical systems heuristics mean. I hope I'm not complicating. <laughs> it rests on what Ulrich terms boundary critiques, which which got its own associated issues. And to understand this is that in the center of this critical system heuristics is the idea to expose and examine the assumptions we make when defining a situation. What are the things we consider to be relevant in terms of knowledge and values? And what do we exclude? A critical systems um, heuristics approach questions these assumptions critically, leading to a more inclusive and nuanced understanding of the world. And by questioning these areas, then those, those situations include, you know, basis of motivation, basis of power, basis of knowledge, basis of legitimacy, all those kind of things when considered, um, they uncover hidden biases, identify alternative perspectives, and make more informed decisions. And that's what critical systems mean. And that was a methodological approach that I thought would be useful for us to take in this case. And finally, the tool. And here, I would really like to thank my mentor and uh, EMBA supervisor, Professor Johan Strumpf, who's sitting there. Thank you very much. So, what Strumpf, I'm going to talk about Messi, he's not here. What Strumpf, <laughs> what Strumpf does in using what he calls a multiple perspective tool is to give a tangible, and objective expression to Ulrich's methodological approach while firmly anchored on Churchman's philosophy that underpins it. Each perspective can be seen as a set of questions, um, of answers to six questions. And those questions, roughly speaking, are what needs to change and from what to what, which what would call transformation. Whom does this change seek to benefit? What sits at the heart of this change? That and that's what you call purpose of this transformation. How would we know that this change has in fact taken place, or at least that we are in the right direction, or if not, that we are failing to do so? And that's what we'll call um, a measure of performance. And what would have to hold true for this change to be meaningful? That means what assumptions underlie our approach? And finally, what are the potential barriers to the envisaged change? That which uh, Strumpha calls um, constraint. And so armed with this tool, I approached prominent members or involved in different aspects of child well-being with a simple question. What in your reckoning constitutes child well-being? I have to say that the main motivation was not to conclusively answer this question but rather to explore whether this tool can in fact be a way to address this question going forward, given its philosophical underpinnings, which I thought were quite valuable as a tool for reflection. However, it is quite clear that this process confirms what most of us already know and already are aware of. It is not possible to realize child well-being in, piecemeal, in a piecemeal manner that does not factor in all aspects of society and without involving all members of our society in a meaningful way in the construction of new realities. The individuals I interviewed, all really, really amazing people who I can tell you, none of them see the issue of child well-being as some sort of a job or a role, but they're personally invested, which was really amazing to have this kind of discussion. The viewpoints, and you can see here, that I got from these were transformed into perspectives. And by perspectives, I mean the answering of those six questions that I mentioned, because that is what a perspective is. And the, the viewpoints and perspectives contained areas that are changeable, what I would like to call variables, and I'm going to come to that now, as well as the actions needed to bring the changes. These were then put together to create a schema 
of what it would all look like if they were all brought together into one unified whole that looks at the whole of society. That's basically the simple thing I was trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> what did I discover? <laughs> This simple diagram <laughs> shows just a few things that I would like to list. It shows that it's not possible to make children well unless you look after their mothers. It should be immediately obvious to a society such as ours that does not value women, that child well-being is impossible. And unless that changes, our children have no hope. Two, it is not possible to bring about the wellness of children and their mothers while at the same time neglecting their community, including family units. As one of the participants pointed out, Sweden only turned around its child health outcomes when it invested into supporting struggling families. Last night's uh, talk by Anita was entitled, It Takes a Village to Raise uh, a Child. You know, while this notion has always resonated with me, I'm beginning to understand that in a coherently integrated society, the reverse is as valid. It takes a child to raise a village. And that's because if society starts taking the well-being of children seriously, it will have to change so much that the well-being of everyone will be accommodated. That's just as simple as that. If you look after children and their mothers, you will have a better society. You can't do it in any other way. It's as simple as that. Thirdly, political will is critical to creating an environment in which child well-being can be realized. And political will can be passive or active. So you would like politicians to work positively towards realizing of this. You can see from this diagram how much that matters to child safety, to the safety of communities. And so but at times, you just want them not to interfere too much so that other people can get on with work. <laughs> Fifth, everything is connected to everything, and that's important. It is important to note that most of what is required to achieve the well-being of children lies outside the healthcare environment. It would be absolutely foolish to try and improve the well-being of children by building more hospitals. You know, as my mentor sitting here, Louis Reynolds, will point out, doesn't help you if you're trying to stop children from drowning to just hire more lifeguards without stopping and asking who the hell is throwing them into the water to start with. <laughs> and so what we tend to do and think about healthcare, we think about it almost as what should give health. It's interesting to note that high income countries do not get better healthcare by building more hospitals but by making sure people don't get sick. And so it is with child well-being. And finally, sweeping in multiple perspectives, as uh, Johann Strumpau put it, allows us to see where the gaps are and who's missing from the table. Because multiple perspectives bring people together, if you bring these people together to be able to understand, you'll soon realize that there are some missing the table. And that's quite important, which is why with this, I wonder and ask, I mean, I couldn't interview any children. I didn't interview anyone from a rural area. I didn't interview certain professions and certain other groups and areas of people. Immediately you start seeing gaps. So that model can be built to be more complex to reflect the complexity of the world. It doesn't help you to create models of understanding that are simpler than the problem is supposed to solve because they will fail. Um, Koshik likes uh, quoting uh, um, Harry uh, Tsukas who says, don't simplify, complexify. 
it simply means that the tool you use to respond must be appropriate for what it's supposed to do. And the complex world may very well demand complex models because they're the only ones that can contain it in order to make a difference. And that's what this means. So, should I move this so that? So you may ask, what now? This is the whole point I was trying to make. To answer this question, I'll tell you a story that for me, and uh, those who know me may have been telling this story a number of times. It carries a sense of epiphany for me. And again, it happened uh, 15 years ago. I had gone to a conference in Canada. And one of the speakers who had recently returned from the south of the US had visited a slavery museum. <laughs> the experience so horrified him that he asked himself a question, how could this happen? How did people who thought of themselves as good people, you know, good Christians, manage to justify <laughs> their endorsement and even profiting from slavery? Indeed, how did people who similarly saw themselves as good support Hitler's rule of terror and the Holocaust? And in the South African setting, a similar question as it pertains to apartheid. How did people manage to support it all these years, voting every four years for the same party, knowing what to do? So that is the question he asks. And when the answer came back to him, it really hit him. He said he realized why. They did not have the courage to see through the evil of their own culture. And that realization led him to a different question. Is there evil right now that we are part of, that we are supporting either directly or indirectly, perpetuating such evil today that we do not see evil which future generations will judge us for as those who took part in slavery are similarly judged because we do not have the courage to see through the evil of our own culture. And I believe that the wellness or lack thereof of the African child is one such area of evil that we perpetuate and we don't see it. I opened with the Chivenda poem that may have shocked you because most Sims don't speak Chivenda, which is quite strange. <laughs> <laughs> the poem, which is titled Usiwan, this word can be directly translated as orphanhood, but should perhaps better translated more accurately as destitution. In only four lines of which the poem consists, Tiguaburimu, the poet, paints the apparent inescapable hopelessness of the human condition. We are human, he says. We are empty handed. Each heartbeat is but a stranger in transit. To this thing, we can lay no claim. The current form is beyond us to command. Revert to Arnachash. It may seem to some that I'm just going on and on about this hopelessness thing and going on my way to depress everyone. <laughs> my intention is the exact opposite, as was Sigwaburimu's intention. I wish I had the whole evening to build the context of these four lines within Sigwaburimu's thought processes. Um, some of you know that I probably read more poetry than medical books. It's been the case. <laughs> Suffice it to say here that what he intends to do is to highlight the futility of narrow individualized worldviews in which the self is isolated from the communal. The futility has to be recognized if new forms have to be built. If we have to have a chance of redeeming situations, situations that are seen as hopeless, we first and foremost have to develop the courage and honesty to see the situation for what it is. You don't emerge out of hopelessness by ignoring that your situation by default is hopeless. You have to start with that. 
Following this, we will need to find ways of creating integrated communities in which different perspectives needed to leave the questions can be found and such perspectives can find a home. And even if we do not know the way or how to get there, it's a journey we cannot avoid. The well-being of the African child is important to be realized and we take that as our mandate. We can find some solace and encouragement from the words of Wendell Berry. If you remember what he says when he says, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to a real work, and that when we no longer know which way to go, we have come to a real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. So it's in the spirit of this, before I conclude, that I would like to give thanks to the community that has cocooned me before and today, so that the human weaknesses that I carry can be partially offset. And to this, I can think of a lot of mentors, both still with us and those departed, but definitely not forgotten. I'm thinking about uh, some of you who are sitting here, like, you know, Louis, uh, Mary Jane Reynolds, who are here, uh, Professor Marion Jacobs. I see my head of department when I arrived here, uh, you know, Dave Power. There are a number of these, and behind him, another one of my head of my previous head of funds. I'm actually quite privileged to have a number of heads of departments here that have been and served as mentors. And, um, uh, and then there is uh, our Professor Wangan Mayosi, who is never too far away from our thoughts at every turn. The many friends online, those um, who are sitting here, and I just have to mention my good friend Charles, who traveled the whole way from Joburg. <laughs> as well as my good friend Mukoni, who will give a vote of thanks. Mukoni and I started school uh, the same rainy day under the same tree in our village. And I'm truly grateful to my parents too for everything. They have done for all of us, you know, your five children. Uh, for me specifically, thank you for the words you gave me as a child that are echoed by the two divergent world, worlds that you, you inhabit, in fact. One expression says, what shall it profit a man to keep the whole world and lose his soul? And another one that says, what mafura you? People are a lotion that brightens your visage. And because of this gift, I will always be free. Through you, which is why I put this picture here, I've inherited a multitude of generations through whose eyes I see the world and whose words I use to think. Thank you to Vere and Gina. Um, in a very real way, you know, uh, you are part of the reason I'm here today. You know, you and Gina have been the most important agent for the doors that closed and could not be opened, and those that opened and could not be closed that led me to this podium. And Vere, twice named for a great grandmother and grandmother you are still to meet. You have given me a true appreciation of the value of the African child. So thank you very much. You. And then to all of you who have made this not insignificant sacrifice of being here tonight, and being present to listen to me. Thank you. It is my hope that I've aroused in you some sort of thirst for the well being of the African child. And with that hope that a community can achieve if it chooses to do so. I end with a gift for all of you a question that is framed by the words of 
Luis Rosales. This is what I wrote. Can these bones live? Here in the valley of forgotten memories, where each name cries out for its long lost level, where the vultures have long since taken wing, here where the long shadows threaten tomorrow's sun rays, can these bones live? Can they take on the shape of flesh? Can they sprout dreams deep enough to feel the promises you have made? Only you know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rizani, for that inspiring lecture. It uh, gives me pleasure now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to call on Mr. Mukoni Rajatanga to deliver the thanks. Professor Datarelli, the Interim Vice-Chancellor, Professor Lionel Green-Thompson, Professor Heather Zah, <coughs> my sister, Dr. Ngina Masu, and uh, Vere, uh, Professor Tifurupewi Walta Muroiwa, uh, Mrs. Kanakana Muroiwa, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, the Madegwan. Um, I've just whispered to Ruzani that has made my job easier. I will nonetheless read what I had written uh, because uh, I realized as I was speaking that uh, I was not, after all, uh, way of the mark. Now, he's indicated uh, uh, quite correctly that uh, he and I have known each other since 1981. Well, the year was 1981 when we started school, grade one, as little seven year olds. On a day, his good memory recalls it was rainy. <laughs> I confess to having endlessly agonized in attempts to summon back some key aspects of that day to memory, but without much success. <laughs> what I do recall, however, is the anxiety of finding myself in the new and unfamiliar environment into which my late parents had unexpectedly thrust me. I was recently overcome by the same anxiety when Ruzani approached me to speak on <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, oh, okay. No, 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 no. No, sorry, 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 sorry. I had this printed uh, for me, so I didn't realize what was happening. So, sorry about that. But, I am not a medical doctor, after all, or any other health professional. And so, except in the most general terms, I do not know enough to speak competently about matters health without turning myself into an, an object of laughter. Moreover, I simply do not have the nerves of steel to cope with human suffering as doctors and other health uh, professionals ably and most admirably do. This disclaimer notwithstanding, 
I beg your indulgence to make two very brief interrelated suggestions. Before doing so, I must disclose my intention to catch the disclaimer as a mitigating factor in case you consider what I'm about to say as the property of the proverbial fool who trespasses where angels fear to tread. Many of you will be familiar with the Nigerian novelist uh, Chimamanda's Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's thesis, The Danger of a Single Story, which she first proffered in July 2009. She defined a single story as a mono descriptor of people and by implication social phenomena. This, as she put it, leads to quote, a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity, close quote, towards another person or whatever the issue may be. I would like to suggest uh, that the single story in the health uh, domain, one of them, manifests in scant attention being paid, at least in public discourse, to other important elements of the nation's health, such as nutrition, healthy lifestyle, lifestyles and the huge public education efforts required to prevent diseases. This of course attaches uh, with a fair amount of complexity and uh, uh, Rojani uh, uh, alluded to this. Uh, now consider for instance uh, one issue and that is of maize. Uh, and its uh, preponderance over the national diet uh, since uh, uh, a number of, uh, since its introduction to our shores in the 17th and 18th centuries, the resultant collective habits, rituals, beliefs, consumption patterns, and the small matter of economic means its multiple implications on public policy and above all, social and political stability. And according to a paper by Oliver Mendoza Cato et al, published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health, quote, corn or maize is associated negatively with cardiovascular health and other diet-related chronic diseases such as diabetes. This relates to the point that Rudan was making earlier about uh, successful countries are those that prevent people from getting sick. The biggest dangers of the single story as a descriptor of otherwise complex social phenomena are its dehumanizing value, uh, which perpetuates tunnel visions which in turn lead to catastrophic, catastrophic failures in public policy. The second suggestion I would therefore like to make is that an, another of the, of the multiple manifestations of dehumanization and potential public policy failures arising from the single story narrative, <coughs> which will increasingly implicate the medical fraternity amongst others is the thorny issue of migrants and their access to valued public goods such as health care, including, by the way, their children. Let us listen to Chimama and Ngozi, a teacher's personal experience in this regard. <clears throat> Quote, a few years ago, I visited Mexico from the US and the political climate in the US at the time was tense. And there were debates going on about immigration. And, and as often happens in America, immigration became synonymous with Mexicans. There were, there were endless stories of Mexicans as people who were fleecing the healthcare system sneaking across the border, being arrested at the, at the border, that sort of thing, close quote. It rings a bell, doesn't it? But let me not digress. Adiche also recalled, quote, 
walking around on my first day in Mexico, watching the people going to work, rolling up tortillas in the marketplace, smoking, laughing. I remember firstly uh, feeling slight surprise. And then I was overwhelmed with shame. I realized that I had been so immersed in the media coverage of Mexicans as they had become one thing in my mind, the abject immigrants. I had bought into the single story of Mexicans and I could not have been more ashamed of myself, close quote. The point about these two suggestions, and there could be more if we had the time, is hardly novel. It is that interdisciplinarity undergirded by a deep going humanism is an unavoidable imperative for social policy making as it is for the academy. This seems to be at the center of Professor Ruzani Muroiwa's academic concern. For that, he deserves both our encouragement and gratitude. Our thanks must also go to his colleagues in the Faculty of Health, Sciences and the University as a whole. Indeed, there is no vocation more noble than the search for knowledge and no experience more satisfying than to witness its power in solving human problems. I must also thank the leadership of the university for recognizing uh, Ruzani's intellectual brilliance and his honest and sustained labors in the academy as reflected in the decision to confer upon him the well-deserved title of full professor. I am aware that as a humble person, and I can tell you lots about that quality of his, as a humble, <clears throat> as a humble person, titles do not make Ruzani tick. But the achievement we're, made, we're marking and celebrating today belongs not just to him, and we're all therefore within our rights to afford ourselves a little pride and celebration. Which leads me to another set of people who must be acknowledged and eternally thanked for making this evening possible. They are the community of Ngovera, the village from whence he comes. Our dear parents who are here to, uh, tonight, Professor Muroiwa, senior, and Mrs. Muroiwa as well as uh, Ruzani's beloved wife, my sister, Ngina, and Vere and, and the siblings. <laughs> <laughs> Their combined efforts in ultimately getting us to this venue tonight and the path uh, Ruzani will tread into the future is as invaluable as it is and think as it is unquantifiable. Riyali Buwa, Asante Sana, Nkosi, Bayadanki, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mokoni. And I now invite Professor Nevazar to deliver closing remarks. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Rizzoni, Dina, Vele, members of his family, friends, colleagues, the platform party. What a privilege it is to be able to say a few closing words to this giant of a man who we've heard today. <coughs> you've heard about his career trajectory, you've heard about his accomplishments, you've heard his intellectual breadth. And I just want to add, maybe in closing, some personal comments. <coughs> I've known Rizal since he was training in pediatrics at Red Cross Children's Hospital, and I've seen his 
trajectory through pediatrics, through training in pediatric infectious diseases, through his MBA, through his PhD. Let's not forget that. I'm going to come back. Through his leadership positions in the faculty, in the university, and what hasn't been highlighted tonight is his leadership position in vaccine, in vaccines for children, uh, vaccines for Africa, he co-directs, but also his leadership positions on national, regional um, immunization advisory groups and international groups concerned with childhood immunization. And now, of course, as head of Department of Pediatrics and as my boss. <laughs> I'm always very proud to say he was my student. Now. <laughs> I was extremely privileged to supervise his PhD, which, as uh, Professor uh, Lionel Green Thompson mentioned, was on whooping cough in children. And this is a completely preventable disease in children who receive the appropriate immunization. But Rizzoni in his work not only showed that it was a really important cause of children being hospitalized at Red Cross, but he undid existing dogma that has existed for years. The World Health Organization and other big um, uh, other bodies who put out practice guidelines had in their guidelines that children should be diagnosed with whooping cough only if they'd coughed for two weeks or more. Well, Rizzani showed actually children develop illness within one to two days, and many children were not being diagnosed or treated. And he identified vulnerable groups of young children who were more at risk of severe disease, those living with HIV, those whose mothers had HIV, but who themselves were not infected because of our very good mother-to-child prevention program, those who were partially immunized. And this has contributed to changing global guidelines, WHO guidelines, our own guidelines, and most recently, the introduction of the vaccine for whooping cough for pregnant women in this country, which was only introduced this year as a strategy to protect their infants. Such work also put him on a pathway to African, local, and global advocacy for immunization access for all children, for equitable and affordable access, a road that has still got a long, far way to go, but where Rizani is a giant too. So what underlies such a man and such work? He has extraordinary vision as exemplified by his brilliant photography. Look at this photograph that he took of a mother and child. There's the theme of mother and child that he's raised before at Red Cross Children's Hospital, and that we were privileged to be able to put on a major international um, uh, um, publication of the global burden of respiratory diseases in the world. You can see his empathy, his care, his care for the most vulnerable. <laughs> so I'm not going to be much longer. <laughs> but I just do want to highlight the incredible qualities that he embodies empathy, care, compassion, fairness, the ability to listen a commitment to absolute integrity, his extraordinary ability to mentor and support, and then his deep commitment to social justice, to equity for children everywhere. <laughs> what extraordinary <coughs> qualities there are, and how fortunate we are to have him as a leader. Thank you, Rizani, for your inspiring leadership, for your example, for the work you do for children in Africa and beyond. Thank you. Um, I think we can all exit. 
It's yes. always a surprise. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Thanks very much, Heather. Um, so, colleagues, dear friends, that uh, concludes the formal part of the proceedings. Uh, would you please join us um, upstairs in the foyer, I think, where refreshments will be served and where we'll have an opportunity to chat further with our you know, we'll lecture and, and with other. So I uh, thank you very much again for being with us. Um, the platform party will leave. Uh, if you would please stand, uh, allow us to leave and then join. Thank you.